It's time for another literary reading from Alaska Quarterly Review and the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center. You can find recordings of our previous star-studded programs at our website, aqreview.org, and our YouTube channel. Uh, welcome. I'm Heather Lendy, the Alaska State Writer Laureate, and on behalf of the Center for Narrative and Lyric Arts, thank you for being here today. Kunishchish, as we say, where I am on the banks of the Chilkat River in uh, Haines, or Deshu, Alaska, in, in Klinkit Ani, and the land of the Chilkat Kwan and Chilkut Kwan. While this program is free, AQR, like all literary journals, could use your help, so please consider a donation to support the publication of Fine Writing. We have three terrific writers today, Alaskan poet and literary administrator, Aaron Coughlin Hollowell, legendary Michael Waters, and poet, teacher, and literacy advocate, Kelly Russell Agadon. So stay tuned. But first, I'd like to introduce Ron Spatz. Ronald Spatz is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Alaska Quarterly Review. He's a professor of English at the University of Alaska and a former National Endowment for the Arts Fellow and the recipient of two Alaska Governor's Awards and a Contribution to Literacy Award from the Alaska Center for the Book. Under Ron's uh, over 40 years of enthusiastic leadership and vision, the Alaska Quarterly Review has created strong connections between our state of Alaska and the larger literary community. And it's also uh, been influential in supporting new and emerging writers, as well as presenting works that include a rigorous questioning of larger societal issues, as this series uh, more than demonstrates. Ron? Well, thank you, Heather, <clears throat> and welcome, everyone. This event is being recorded and will be available on the Alaska Quarterly Review YouTube channel. Please feel free to watch any of our prior programs and to share them. Alaska Quarterly Review is committed to presenting these programs without charge and to showcase vibrant and diverse new and emerging voices in literary conversations with depth, complexity, and humanity. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few important acknowledgments. Alaska Quarterly Review gratefully acknowledges the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center for hosting and the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, Alaska Quarterly Reviews, 501c3 organization that makes this event possible. I also want to make a land acknowledgement. Alaska Quarterly Review recognizes the indigenous land on which all Alaskans live. A QR is located in Anchorage and Anchorage is Denina homeland. Denina is the language spoken by the traditional present and future caretakers of this land and land acknowledgement opens a space with gratefulness and respect for the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspective of indigenous peoples and marks our collective movement toward decolonization and equity. Joining me today as co-moderator is Heather Lindy. Heather is the author of four books, all published by Algonquin. If you lived here, I'd know your name, take good care of the garden and the dogs, find the good, and of bears and ballads. And now to begin, I send it over to Heather. Thank you, Ron. Um, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce our uh, writers today, uh, beginning with uh, uh, my friend, Erin Coughlin Hollowell is a, is a whirlwind. She's a fabulous poet, writer, organizer, and advocate for, for voices that have not been traditionally published. All this, and she lives uh, peacefully at the end of the road in Alaska, in Homer, where she's engaged in the community on many levels, including as the executive director of Story Knife Writers Retreat and the director of the Kachemak Bay Writers Conference. Prior to landing in Alaska, Erin lived on both U.S. coasts in big cities and small towns, pursuing many different professions from tapestry weaving to arts administration. She is the author of Pause Traveler, and Every Atom, both published by Boreal Books, and her collection Corvus and Crater is forthcoming from Salmon Poetry in 2023. And also congratulations, Erin has uh, been named a Black Earth Institute Fellow for 2022 to 2025. Erin Coughlin Hollowell, who says, poetry is sustenance and connection, neat and neat. 
Poetry has the power to illuminate the human condition, to bond crafted words and considered ideas, and most importantly, perhaps create relationships between people. Michael Waters is a teacher, a prolific and much proclaimed uh, poet. He has over a dozen books to his credit, most recently Sinner Man, uh, 2023, and Caw in 2020, the Dean of Discipline from the University of Pittsburgh Press in 2018, and the co-edited anthologies Borderlines, Poems of Migration in 2020, and Real Verse, R-E-E-L, Poems about the Movies in 2019. Darling Vulgarity in 2006 was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and Parathenope, uh, New and Selected Poems, um, was a finalist for the Patterson Poetry Prize. Uh, he chaired the poetry panel for the 2004 National Book Awards and was a 2017 Guggenheim Fellow. His co-edited anthologies also include Contemporary American Poetry and Perfect in Their Art, Poems on Boxing, From Homer to Ali. In addition to AQR, his poems have appeared in many journals, including Poetry, Paris Review, the Yale Review, Kenyon Review, American Poetry Review, and the Rolling Stone. He's the recipient of five Pushcart Prizes and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, Fulbright Foundation, the State Arts Councils in, in Maryland and in New Jersey, uh, fellowships and residencies at Yadu, McDowell, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, um, uh, the Tyrone Guthrie Center in Ireland, uh, St. James Cavalier Center in Malta, and the Chateau de la Vigne in Switzerland. And this is my favorite thing about uh, Michael right at the moment because I've been doing this lately as mine broke. He lives without a cell phone in Ocean, New Jersey. It's quite liberating actually. <laughs> Michael Waters, who tells his students What's important is not to dress like a writer or talk like a writer or act like a writer or drink like a writer. What you have to do is actually write. You have to put pen to paper and learn your craft. Kelly Russell Agadon is a prize-winning American poet, writer, and editor. She is the co-founder of the Sylvia's Press and she serves on the poetry faculty at the Rainier Writing Workshop, a low residency MFA program at Pacific Lutheran University. Uh, born and raised in Seattle, Kelly was educated at the University of Washington and PLU's Rainier Writing Workshop, where she received her Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. Her most recent collection of poems is Hourglass Museum, which was shortlisted for the Julie Suk Poetry Prize, honoring the best book of poems published by a small press. She is author, also the author of Daily Poet. Uh, many of us use day-by-day -day prompts for your writing practice which she co-authored with Martha Solano. Her second collection, Letters from the Emily Dickinson Room, was chosen by Pulitzer Prize winner Carl Dennis for the White Pine Press Book Prize. And it was named as winner of Forward Magazine's Book of the Year in Poetry, as well as a finalist for the Washington State Book Prize. Her other books include Small Knots, Geography, and Fire on Her Tongue, an anthology of contemporary women's poetry. Her work has appeared in many places as well, uh, including The Atlantic, O, The Oprah Magazine, Prairie Schooner, New England Review, and has been on Writer's Almanac with Garrison Keillor and is in Keillor's uh, Good Poems for Hard Times anthology. Kelly was the editor of Seattle's 30-year-old print journal, Crab Creek Review, for the last six years, and she recently established the Russell Prize through Two Sylvia's to support poets in the early stages of their career. And she volunteers with senior citizens at uh, North Haven, a, a resident community for senior living. At the Two Sylvia's Press, she is also an editor. She also works as the co-director of Poets on the Coast, a retreat for women's poets, and is a member of the Seattle Seven Writers, a nonprofit group that raises awareness and money for literacy organizations uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Kelly Russell Agadon, who says, I think the best writers have the same qualities in the end, a mix of talent and a large dash of stubbornness to keep writing and go through rejections and dry spells. I've also learned, she writes, that writing isn't a waste of time, whether I'm published or not, it's the writing that fulfills me. So today, Aaron is gonna be our first reader and then Michael and Kelly uh, will uh, wrap it all up for us. So without further ado, Aaron. 
Hi, I'd like to thank the Alaska Quarterly Review and Ron Spatz for this opportunity and Heather for that beautiful introduction. And I'd like to thank um, Alaska Quarterly Review for something else, which is really being a mainstay for Alaskan writers and writers all around the world. It's a real privilege to be part of it and uh, to be published there. My first three poems are from my book, Every Atom, which chronicles how my mother and I navigated her descent into dementia, and it interrogates memory in general. The, um, the titles of all three come from uh, Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. All goes onward and outward, nothing collapses. My mother asks me to call my father. Tell him to come get me. My father is sitting next to her on the sofa as she says this. He is the one who handed her the phone. Who remains when the labels wear away? The elderly man who tells me not to worry is no longer her husband. He dons a stranger's face each morning. The woman who cannot bear to open her eyes and see the unfamiliar room has wandered beyond wife, beyond mother. The snow today sweeps across the landscape, blotting out the terrain around my house. First the mountains disappear, then the water, the trees on the other side of the road, the road itself, and now all is white, a closed space, snow hissing against the window panes. The world we are born into is not the one that clings to us as we leave, white. Remember the crab apple tree that bloomed in the backyard? Such extravagance of pale petals. There's a, a photograph of my mother and I standing beneath it. I was 13, I plunged towards everything. She was perfectly still. Mother, I'm telling the truth. There is white and the pause that surrounds it. Snows small blossoming into the night. Uh, this poem is about an experience that I think uh, every parent dreads. It was when my brother passed away. Waits by the hole in the frozen surface. I remember kneeling before my brother's coffin, but of my mother's grief, there is a hole, as if I've taken scissors and neatly cut her from the day. But not really, because there was my father in a dark suit with his hand on the shoulder of the hole in the front row of the funeral home with its cheap carpets and the flat gray light that plagues March. The wretched scrape of snow, the earth too frozen to dig a grave, and wind pushing its bitter fingers into everything. My sister sat in the same row as the hole that was my mother, but I sat across the aisle. I had been standing for a long time in the back of the room, listening to the little songs of comfort that people were offering, like mouthfuls of potato salad. There were bouquets of improbable colors, flowers from far away, because nothing blooms in March in upstate New York, except broken green beer bottles and soda cans in the dirty ditches. And on the way home, my then husband said that maybe it would have been better if my brother had never been born. And I felt as if I'd swallowed an ember, which burned, was burning through a hole in the ice, a hole in the snow, a hole that leaked tears finally. Because I don't remember seeing my mother cry because some things are not seeable, like your mother with a hole in her that you will never be able to fill. And finally, a furlong without sympathy. Blood vessels mapping my eyelids in the afternoon, a jewel of a nap. Sunlight mapping the blood vessels. If only I carried the route like that, I carry part of the story you carry. No wonder you sleep in the afternoon. You carry the weight of an explorer past this life. You are mapping us back to cells made by your blood, rooted in your body. We splashed into you the way a road branches beyond the map, the route, a surprise until you reach a grove of sugar maple, dreaming 
like the way your heart moves, the blood warm as sunlight. No wonder this life has too many hours for you to remember. Your blood, you carried us, you vessel, mother. These next three poems are from my collection Corvus and Crater, which is forthcoming. Each of the 54 poems in the collection consists of 54 syllables, six lines of nine syllables. And these poems imagine many things, but these three are centering around, what if Ted Hughes's crow was female? Corvus and Crater. Roadside prophet, hagstones and feathers rattle you along. Until evening, you find your tree, brute, birch, spruce, or alder, and there on perch or curl into wild rose or raspberry thicket. Tell us, who loves the keyhole over the key? Ritual for accounting for the plumb line. Map wing path, skies hatchers and circuit. Find where your trail overlaps with crow's concentric circles of pain weaving. Is it blood work or blind reckoning? Nettle, Yarrow and Devil's Club know the broken hair under the elder. Ritual for washing hands with starlight. The mountain sign leaned against the light like a dun cow. Everywhere she went, there were empty saucers tucked into hedges and around corners, branches wound with torn ribbons. She might find crow feathers in her sleeve when the sun rose. This poem is from a collection that is a collaboration with the artist a Andrea Wollensack and will be part of the first Friday opening at the Rass Museum, Rasmussen Museum in Anchorage. Instruct instructions for compass truing. Uh, it has an epigraph. When obstacles are too large, wait for better directions. One. Put your hands in the surf to hold back the tide. Two, your voice is small compared to any wave's voice. Your words small and brief compared to the long grumble of a breaker cantering down the beach. So always whisper. Three, ocean water is the key that fits the beach's tumblers, unlocks a thousand thousand lives, most hidden and arcane. Fill your pocket with brine water. Four, the ceremony of the tide is 34 parts per thousand salt, burning the eyes and nose and carrying the moon's task list. Five, prepare a list of five confessions written on kelp. The tide has a taste for long homilies. Six, fate is one way to read the rack line. Decision to investigate is the other way to read it. Bring glasses whose lens are made of fog and be prepared to study long. Seven, is the water radiant or simply a suspension of many small lives and tattered seaweed, which shines now in winter's low slant of light? Choose one stone from the wave edge and carry it beneath your tongue. Eight, the tide can come in and strand a person not paying attention. Water over the boots is either a mistake or the first part of the story. Repeat once upon a time to the waves until they retreat. Nine, bring a bag to carry whatever losses the ebb tide leaves behind. Something, sometimes at night, it can feel as if the ocean is grieving the way it pats the sand with its little hands, assuring itself that it's not alone. Finally, I'll end with a poem that first found print in AQR. Um, this poem was originally dedicated to Eva Salidas, a really wonderful poet and friend, um, but now I'd like to also add that dedication, my friend Sherry Simpson. It's uh, entitled Louds, and it has an epigram from Ralph Waldo Emerson, I am part or particle of God. 
I spoke to darkness. I spoke to the dancing couple, two planets conjoined, whirling above mountains until they dipped behind the bench. I spoke to a blush and brightness that kindled along the rim, then traveled. Am this, am this flesh on this bone scaffolding, am this growl, this run of consonants without reason, am this way, and then that way. And this frost ridden air smoking from my lungs. Part of the day broke, part of the story broke, part of what humanity fashioned itself as broke, part of a blue plate dropped on the floor, broken into so many pieces it could not be mended or used again, or used the way a young woman uses her hips, or used the way an older woman uses the mirror, which has become her reckoning. Particle, particle of the future, particles of stardust on the top of the refrigerator. I write my name in it. Particles of light, which are simultaneously waves. Particles of a particular nature, which is me, which was me. Particle of dawn of the way each day becomes itself, each sky a sudden parachute of light, of refraction and reflection, of the bay holding fire from the sky, holding blankness like a mirror, of my gain, of my loss. God, who doesn't ride a chariot, God, who doesn't explain why some live, some live, and some die. God who says, we all die, even God. God who speaks to me from the dark sky or what was the dark sky that is now filled with every size of flame. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Erin, that was a beautiful reading, very moving. Poems, a real pleasure to listen to them. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here to read for the uh, very judiciously edited Alaska Quarterly Review. I'm going to read uh, six new poems. Prayer with Caravaggio. I will no longer enter a cathedral unless it conceals a single Caravaggio in a recess reeking of incense where one bulb illuminates the oils that they may shine more darkly, that I might recognize the human flaws in divine depictions and weep with wonder. I'd rather stroll the local mall, the Galleria in Milan, where women burdened with bags stop to scratch with one push the bull's huge balls for luck. That mosaic on the tiled floor, a snorch near sliding open doors where summer's dense ungodly heat hammers the falsely frigid air while prayers exhaled for centuries from nearby pews and candled naves diminish in the vaulting. Here is my prayer, murmured over ice, shaved into a paper cup, euroed from a vendor at the bottom of these cathedral steps where I sprawl, a syrup a sweetening my tongue. I will no longer enter a cathedral, but wherever I go, I'll still pray with the sinful devotion of Caravaggio who paid his prostitute robed in blue to pose for a tableau as the poxed yet holy Virgin Mary. And this is a poem from my very early boyhood. It's titled Brooklyn Walk Up. Too often my mother told the story of bundling me into the red snowsuit, leaving me scarved and ear flapped, zippered to the chin, 
baby bootied upon the quilted bed while she wrestled the carriage six flights down tenement steps, only to return to a locked door, the key nestled in a handbag dangling from the inside hook. A cry like no other rose inside her. She rushed again down crooked stairs out onto Covert Street, past the deli and funeral parlor, all the way around the corner to the Irving Avenue alley, where she grasped and then climbed this new mother, the fire escape ladder rung by icy rung to reach the first metal landing, then clanged upward floor by floor until crouched upon the uppermost grate, she could see the swollen, immobile, doll-shaped pile. She raised the unclasped window, gathered me, grabbed her bag, descended once more the six floors to the cold carriage, then raced to the DeKalb Avenue BMT to meet my father home from work. Wheeled madly, I slept like a bobbing cork. She never told him how she'd shut me in, how she gazed through glass at the clump of cloth, the breathing heap of wool and cotton for which she'd leapt beyond her measure. Motherhood had turned uncommon. Years later, she took such pleasure in repeating the story that boy swathed like an Andean child sacrificed on the mountain peak, mummified by the dry glacial winds, never to name his executioner, that boy, her favorite version of me. My father's comb. When my mother insisted that I take something, his five inch aluminum lifetime already outlined my back pocket. The comb I watched him ply how many thousand mornings to rake his hair straight back while I waited my turn before the bathroom mirror. I wielded a 39 cents ace hard rubber with a dab of brill cream to slick my mop before school. But for years now, I've run his comb as he did under the cold water tap, then dragged across my scalp only the shorter tines of the guillotine shaped tool of vanity and work ethic. Please take something, she'd said, my father three days dead, but I'd already nabbed the one object I knew I'd touch each day in such casual ritual to comb the grief away. This poem is in the current issue of AQR. Maybe those of you who had a young daughter as I did in 1991 began to use something called the, the Topsy Tale, which was patented by a woman named Tomima Edmark that year, 1991. My daughter was, was three. Or those of you who have had children since then, um, young women, maybe you've used this um, with them. Topsy Tale. Winter mornings, not fully risen, still hunched on the mattress's seamed edge. I am there again, a slumped on a distant bed, woozy, dream deep in flannel pajamas as you shuffle barefoot from your room, a sleep flushed in a rugrat's nightgown. With the brush you brought me, I stroke your hair, its lush tangle, Static electricity leaping off each bristle, off fingers a smoothing a wayward curl, a mini pageantry to ignite the day. I coax light.
from this celestial circuitry, the bedroom beginning to brighten until hair flows along your spine, then slip a band onto that sparkling cascade, sesame open the hair above and with the cheap pink plastic dime store tool, loop your ponytail through that portal into this French style of sweeping your neck. I could almost weep at how little it takes to make you content. You race to the television full of cartoons this Saturday morning, 30 years ago. I miss that light, that living Rothko radiance, though no, such brilliance must still exist, must crackle when someone else who loves you gathers your hair in their gentle hands. And this is another poem that's in the current issue of, of AQR. Um, it takes place in Las Terrenas, which is a small fishing village in the Dominican Republic where I've gone each year for the past 20 years and more. And during the pandemic, I, I was able to be there for, for seven months. And so poems started to come out of that particular locale. So this is titled Reading, Reading Nietzsche on the Beach. They might be walking on water. Those boys balanced on rubber soles, straddling the razor edge of the reef where they knit sardines flashing like silver coins spilled in sun. If Jesus comes again, he might not appear as a Dominican teen, but rather as this bent over leathery grandfather hauling a canvas sack of green coconuts on his back to sell to tourists who kneels next to me to unshoulder his burden, then punctures one shaven and machete whittled crown to reveal the cool, clear, and almost sweet water that fails to quench this thirst to watch beyond my book for any sign of divinity. This old man chewing toothlessly with so much pleasure, his jagged square of coconut meat, or that teen seeming, at least from this webbed chair, to walk upon the sea, splashing lightly now toward shore, his flesh above dead coral, a vertical black slash against the unreachable horizon, and waving. He's waving back at me. And this last poem takes place in Athens, Greece. It mentions um, a very good British gin that you may know, Boodles. Melrose. We named the bar Diva because we couldn't decipher the gold Greek script stenciled on its window, though it may have read maestro or even overture, as the bar was located off Posidonos across from the National Opera House. Late afternoons, the unlit tap room empty and cool, I'd idle on a bar stool having taught a novel by Wharton or James to wait for my wife who engaged in conversational English with dropouts who hoped to find work in the States. I imagined myself in love with Parthenope, quick and pretty and mainly Greek. Her name common, little virgin. And as I sipped a second Restina, I pictured our Laurentian life together on her island with its homemade wines and edible day lilies and ringing bells as flocks descended hillocks to sheds before the sun extinguished itself in the amphora of the Aegean. Pastoral, my dream life remained adolescent and 
pastoral. And as I bided time when early dusk, the bartender, whose name I forget, placed a bottle of Greek gin on the bar top next to an empty bottle of top shelf British, then slipped a white plastic funnel into one small mouth and began to splash the cheap brand into the boodles. Seeing my surprise, he motioned, not for you, then nodded toward the opera house, of course. Then my wife arrived. You must change your life, wrote Wilka, but how? We returned home to the familiar arc of an American tale, but even now I can recall that label. I'd purchased a bottle on our stroll home to see how awful any gin could taste and discovered, dear ex, dear reader, that it didn't burn my throat nearly as much as I thought, though I knew I'd never drink that gin again. Thanks so much for listening and thank you AQR for having me read for you. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, now it's Kelly's turn. Michael and Aaron, that was wonderful to listen to. It's hard to remember that I'm supposed to read too. I'm Kelly Russell Agadon, and I'm so thankful for Ron and Heather and Alaska Quarterly Review for creating this space for poetry. Because my poem was called Light Projections, the one that was published in AQR, I've decided that all the poems I read today will mention light in some form. I'm going to start with the poem um, that was published in AQR called Light Projections, but as you know, um, poets cannot keep their fingers off of things, and it has been revised, and it's now called Peddling Light. Peddling Light. Sometimes the wax wings mistake the full moon for a nest, and across a blanket of plum blossoms, three quail mistake the hedge for an address. It can be hard to recognize an error. Like the time I held the red-winged blackbird after it flew down the chimney, I mistook it for a prayer until it wasn't, until it became a broken wing. Someday I'll love what arrives without the fear I will harm it. Like love, like hope, like the girl who sold halos for 50 cents. Occasionally, there'll be a sale, but mostly a no thanks, and I'm sorry. Some days, the neighborhood was mostly hills, and a silhouette of a child pulling a red wagon door to door, full of circles of light. Um, the other poems are going to come from a brand new collection called Dialogues with Rising Tides that um, just came out from Copper Canyon Press. And it's a book about trying to find uh, calmness in a chaotic world, which is something I think many of us are seeking. This first poem was taken um, was taken, the title was taken from an article I was reading about magpies and that they recognize themselves in, in the mirror. And I started to think of us as humans and um, if we can see ourselves in other people. Um, and it explores what we do if we see someone struggling in a public situation. Magpies recognize themselves in the mirror. The evening sounds like a murder of magpies, and we're replacing our cabinet knobs because we can't change the world, but we can change our hardware. America breaks my heart some days, and some days it breaks itself in two. I watched a woman having a breakdown in the mall today, 
and when the security guard tried to help her, what I felt was all of us peeking from her purse as she threw it across the floor into Forever 21. And yes, the walls felt like another way to hold us. And when she finally stopped crying, I heard her say to the fluorescent lighting, someday the sky is too bright. And like that, we were her flock in our black coats and white sweaters. Some of us reaching our wings towards her and some of us flying away. Um, this next poem, the light comes at the end um, and it's really about having anxiety but wanting to really feel connected in the world also while feeling that anxiety. It's called, I don't own anxiety, but I borrow it regularly. Once I believed the saint I carried could keep me safe. He lived in a rain jacket I wore to keep out the weather, and by weather, I mean danger. Tell me a story where no one dies. That story begins in heaven, ends in heaven, and includes chapters on heaven, heaven, and heaven. It's not really a story, but a wish or a concern. Sometimes I wonder if there's one moment when no one is dying, where we all exist on this planet without loss. But there are too many of us doing foolish things. Someone is always sipping the arsenic. Someone is always spinning a gun. And then add old age, misfortune, a tree that's leaned too long in the forest and a family of five headed off for a hike. We can't predict our tragedies. We cannot plan a party for the apocalypse because friends of the apocalypse know the apocalypse always shows up uninvited and with a half-eaten bag of chips. This is why some of us wake up in the middle of the night looking for a saint. And maybe your saint is a street light, or maybe the sea, or maybe it's the moment you walk out the door and exist in the darkness, announce to the heavens, that you're still alive. And I have two more poems uh, to share with you today. This poem considers, um, considers all the bad outcomes we've missed and we don't even know we've missed them. The poem is called Grace. Grace, even those who are living well are tired. Even the rock star who swallowed the spotlight, even the caterpillar asleep in an unbalanced cocoon. Who knows how to be happy when a lamb is birthed just to be slaughtered at a later date? It's so tiring how every day is also a miracle. The drunk bees in the plum blossoms, the sliver of sun through the branches. Then on an early morning walk, we find the farmer's granddaughter has fallen in love with the lamb and it will be saved and named Grace. And we are spared for a moment from a new loss and life frolics across the field of wildflowers, never knowing all it has escaped. And my last poem, keeping with the theme of light, is called Light Vessel. And if you don't know what a light vessel is, um, they're like a, uh, I guess you could call them a temporary lighthouse. It's a big ship with a light on it. Um, and they had them a lot in um, the UK and the US. 
And I think that's all you need to know about this. This is just um, all about life and life, I guess. It could be called life vessel, but it's light vessel. Tonight, under an unkissed moon, the recipe is disappearing. A dialogue with rising tides and a light ship crashing against a blue shore of healing. When I struggle in a diorama of traffic, I become the silver orb in a city's pinball machine. Be here now, flung against the pulsing lights and hectic newspapers that paper mache themselves to my legs, my life. I forget it's been years since I've seen neon flicker. Now the only language I speak is seascape, a searchlight, a map made of unintelligible emotions I try to navigate. If I could be any age, I'd be the heartbeat just before the butter melts, where everything is soft and easy, a cookbook for a sacred life. And when I'm desperate for spices, I go to the bodega to buy love. But the owner gives me wine and a new pen, says, I think this is probably better. And how can I argue? I've forgotten to pack a lunch, forgotten how much I ache for anyone to rest their words against my lips. Thank you for listening. Oh, wow. Thank all of you. Um, that was just wonderful. And the everything seemed to just it, like you couldn't have planned it to, to have such a perfect set of pieces to read. And I guess I, I'm sort of thinking that, that they're, they're all right on, on the edge of a kind of um, joy, but also uh, grief. Uh, and 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 how that interplays with with um, uh, your work and and writing and what and maybe why why you think that's where um, uh, you all go. Of course, that's just what I'm thinking. And and you're you're welcome to have a conversation about anything you want because it would probably be better than anything uh, that I come up with. But um, I just love to hear what what you all think about that, that interplay maybe of, of grief and joy and love and how, how we navigate that in, in, our, in, our, in our work and also maybe, maybe why that's where we go. I mean, that, again, like that maybe it's like a way too big a thing. <laughs> so you can just talk about anything you want if it isn't. I don't think it's too big. Did anyone want to start? Okay. Um, I think this is going to, I'm a Capricorn and I've been called a blonde Morticia Adams. So please know this is where this is coming from. But, you know, we are all dying. We are all getting older and we are temporary. And we've been through a lot in the last few years. And so I am very aware of, darkness and sadness and pain. Um, but I also love to be happy and I'm taken every day by, I live in the Pacific Northwest by the sea and the kill deer I saw on the beach this morning. Um, so I see the joy everywhere. And I think it wouldn't be truthful if I only wrote about the joy. And I don't think it would be truthful if I only wrote about the pain. So I go between them a lot in my work. Anyone else? I was giving Michael space to jump in there with some wisdom. I think it was doing that with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think um, just to build on what Kelly just said is, uh, I, you know, I live in, in Alaska where the darkness and the light are very pronounced. And, um, and I mostly get to write during the darkest period of the year because that's when I'm not working as hard as on other things, including the garden and, and my jobs. But um, I do think that 
darkness plays a big role, but every every light has a shadow and every shadow is caused by a light. And, and if you don't have a little of each in there, you're not, it's not a rounded interpretation. Yeah, I agree with, with both of you, certainly. Some of us are getting older than others. And um, as, our, as our parents fall into dementia and, um, and die, and as our friends die, I think it's a struggle always to work toward the affirmative, which Lucille Clifton, um, who had been through so much in her life, um, always thought we should work toward. And, um, and I keep Richard Wilbur in mind, too, who said that um, we need to write out of all aspects of our personality. Um, and so to write out of that one aspect, as he, as he thought, for example, Sylvia Plath did with her, um, her brilliant negative, he called it, I think, he thought that was finally um, um, limiting yourself, I guess. Um, and as much as I love those poems, there are times, of course, that I, I don't want to read them. Um, so no, I'd like to look toward, um, toward the light always, I think, um, though it's harder and harder to do, and it has been for the last few years, especially, let's say it's been especially hard since 2016, um, but I think we're um, hopefully working away from that now, and in writing poems, I want to find something, um, something to be said for the light. Do you think all of you um, really go, go to the personal when you do that and, and actually to, to, to family, it, it almost sounds like. Is that another, um, uh, you know, sort of an, an avenue in when, when you're doing this that maybe has, uh, um, you know, that, that resonates with more than uh, something less specific? You know, like, you know, obviously Erin's writing about her, her mother, you're writing about yours too, Michael, and, and. Yeah, I think it, 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 of course you write from what you know, and, but it's really funny because my, the book that's coming out in the spring, I literally set out not to write about my family. I was like, I don't want to write about my family for a while. Um, and I think, um, yeah, those those topics come in from everywhere. I think that's one of the things that I've always loved about Kelly's work is how voracious she is in the way she looks at the world and how her poetry sparks separate things all together and makes a, you know a really brilliant flair. And so I think, yeah, of course you go to what's biggest in your heart, which is often what's on your doorstep. But part of writing poetry is finding that out in other places, those sparks other places as well. Kelly? Oh, well, well, first, thank you, Erin. That was very sweet of you to say. Um, it's interesting because my next book, I'm also moving away from writing about self and family and like relationships. Um, I want everyone to still love me that has to see me at holidays. Um, and I'm writing more about, um, about, the, about the environment, which is really on my mind a lot. So, um, yeah, I do think sometimes, though, when we we start from what we know and where we are, and now for me, I'm writing a lot more about place, um, just because I'm home, I, being home for two years, <laughs> and, or about, um, has really made me just pay attention more to things that I weren't seeing, I wasn't seeing because I was driving to two Sylvia's Press four times a week, so... And I made a conscious choice this evening. It's getting to be evening here. Um, I made a conscious choice to read poems about about um, about family mostly tonight. Though I could have made a choice to read about about I could have read poems about AIDS and the Taliban and and Trump and other horrors, um, but decided to go with those tonight. Partly because one of the poems in AQR has to do with my daughter. Um, but over the past four years, I, I watched my mother decline into Alzheimer's, and then she died in April. And while that was a gift in some ways, um, oddly enough, and I wonder if other people feel this sometimes too, it made me miss my father, who died 30 years ago. And so, and also I turned, two years ago, I turned 70. 
So I guess that means I have one foot in the grave and the other on a banana, as they, they say. <laughs> so no, so this notion of mortality has been more constant lately. And I think writing about my, my mother, my father, my daughter, I have poems about my son who's 15, then um, those, are, those are things that have been more on my mind at this particular time. I think that's gonna change over the next couple of years um, and as I move toward another, another collection. I write essays and I always, um, I'm, I'm fascinated by um, uh, poets because I, you know, I, so as a reader, I often assume that it's autobiographical, but it isn't necessarily. I mean, it's true to a, an emotional truth, but, you know, just because I read a poem uh, that a poet wrote about, uh, uh, you know, say uh, uh, suicide or childbirth or whatever from every spectrum, that it's actually about them necessarily and I wonder um how how you feel how you navigate that as poets I know um we had one of the readings um one of the AQR series Dorian Lax was on and she talked about uh basically rewriting a, a poem that started out as sort of meeting your boyfriend in a, in a trailer in the desert you may be familiar with it but that there really wasn't much in that that actually happened except purse, the leather purse that she describes, but it, it all came out of a feeling. But when then people assume that this happened in her life, she's like, well, not, not exactly, but for the sake of the poem, I, I wiggled it around. And I'm, I'm curious at how you feel when you, you write something that seems sort of confessional and it isn't, or vice versa, whether it is. And, you know, like you were saying, Kelly, you can't go to family dinners when maybe that isn't exactly how it was. I don't know. I can say about family dinners because this really this is teaching my family to say the speaker has changed my life because I write a lot about depression and melancholy and anxiety and my poor mom was just like Kelly are you okay I'm like mom mom you know it's the speaker of the poem and I always remember what Marvin Bell said which is um, the I in the poem isn't you but someone who knows a lot about you. Yeah, I like that. And yeah. I think so many of our poems begin with, with experience perhaps, but by the time the poems are finished, so much invention has come into those poems. And that invention takes place, I think, because we're talking about subject matter here, but really what we're doing is writing about our language and working with the language. And the poems have to do with, with, with craft and where that craft leads us. And I hear that tonight, I heard that in each of your poems, and certainly Dorian, whom I know is someone who works that way as well. The poem leads us where it wants to go. And, um, and the sounds of words and the meanings of words pull us, pull us along. And we might choose to try to go in a different direction, but the poem should always, should always win and lead us, lead us forward then. And in listening to your poems tonight, Kelly and Erin, then I could hear that craft at work in, in the poems. So thank you for that. Thank you. That was lovely to say. I, I think um, one of my first pieces of writing that was done was a collaborative uh, set of poems with the poet Yvonne Zerbitz down in Southeast Alaska. And uh, it was all about, several of the poems were about uh, abuse. And I can remember sitting in the theater with my husband, my current husband, uh, and the, the lights came up and he turned to me and he said, now they're going to think that I beat you. And I was struck, horrified, and I was like, "No, no, no, no! They won't think that." But it, but it is, it is tempting for people to forget that everything a everything a writer writes doesn't come from their life, um, but some emotion there came from your life, something that needed to get on the page, um, and that's probably in some way from your life, even though it might not be true to the circumstance. Oh, well, thank you, all of you. We've we've had an hour here, and I don't want to keep you any longer than that because you've been very generous with your your time and your thoughts, and of course, as always, your your writing and um, and then also thank thank you all for joining us um, and and watching this and being part of this series. And on behalf of the uh, the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, all our gratitude and generosity. Uh, goes uh, to to 
uh, readers and, and especially to um, these three writers today. And um, uh, please support them uh, by buying their books at your local bookseller. You can order them. You'd be amazed. You can get anything you want, pretty much. And also to subscribing to uh, literary journals like AQR, <laughs> AQR maybe hinted. <laughs> and also, um, Thank you very much to Cody Carver at the Anchorage Museum at the Rasmussen Center um, who uh, produced this program. Ron, uh, the last word is yours, always. Thank you, Heather. <clears throat> Thank you for your great moderation. Thank you, Kelly, Aaron, and Michael. Beautiful reading, powerful, very grateful, uh, and very moved by it. And, uh, you know, when you do this, you never know who you're going to reach with your words. And uh, they were powerful tonight. So thank you so much. So with that, um, thank you all for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you and bye-bye for now.